not real mobile, but um, is expecting maybe a surgery coming up here in early August that would be beneficial and helpful for him. And so we're, we're praying that he's able to have that and that things go forward and that he starts to, uh, what's that, Sarah? It's working. Oh, great, great. Okay, so uh, as I was just saying, prayer requests. So we're continuing to pray for Jim Stiles. And, and then also um, Katrina Weigel's uncle, who his name is Scott. Uh, what? Dennis. Okay. Dennis, um, who has been struggling with health issues, but now also recently diagnosed with a brain tumor, is on hospice care. And so um, we pray for him and uh, his wife. He's married, correct? You, you said that last night. Okay. Of course, for Katrina and, uh, and the whole family, as they um, go through this time, await uh, what is uh, certainly coming. So um, I also talked with Fears uh, about Joel, and he is, he is starting a new chemo treatment again. Um, he has uh, been doing radiation. Of course, his cancer that was small cell lung cancer had spread to his brain. And so um, uh, just a real hard time they're going through, of course. And so we'd be praying for Joel's healing, but also for um, Arden and Sharon in there. The, the way that they are just um, have been relocated, uh, their life has entirely changed as well. And uh, so I'm sure, I'm sure that's, that's very hard to do. And so we pray for them, for Jerry and uh, Leanne Lugadensky as well. Uh, Jerry is, is doing treatments again. And um, I haven't talked to him this week. I tried to reach out uh, to talk, but I didn't get a hold of them uh, recently. But a couple of weeks ago, talking to Jerry, I happened to call him um, just by chance right when he was sitting in the chair for the first treatment. And um, as Jerry is, you know, he's got good spirits and he's very optimistic. And so, but um, I know it's, it's been a long road and it's real hard and it, it's hard to, hard to know where it goes from here, but we just pray for um, good things to, to happen and healing. Um, let's see here. Oh, I'll just point out that any cards or notes of encouragement that you might have for Joel Fuhrer uh, can be sent to the address that's listed in the bulletin. So maybe take a look at that, and if you have some time, someday send a card. Um, I'm sure they would appreciate that. Okay, I think that might be, that might be all the announcements. Um, and, well, I know it's all the announcements and uh, prayer requests that are listed, but is there any that need to be added this morning? Any at all? Any prayer requests? Good? Okay. All right. Well, we will then jump right in. If you would, please stand, and we'll begin on page 56, the order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our neighbors as our heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. 
To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for our opening hymn, Seek Ye First. for the Kyrie, page 57. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. You may remain standing for the hymn of praise, Great is Thy Faithfulness, page 771. Thank you. 
standing now for the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Benevolent God, you are the source, the guide, and the goal of our lives. Teach us to love what is worth loving, to reject what is offensive to you, and to treasure what is precious in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'll have you be seated, and we'll invite the readers forward for today's reading. The first reading for today is found in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 2, 12 through 14, and chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me, and who, and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish, Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who, no, who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. The psalm for today is Psalm 49, verses 1 through 12, found on page 237. We will read this half verse by half verse. Page 237, Psalm 49. Hear this, all you peoples. Hear can all you who dwell in the world. You of high degree and low, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom. I will incline my ear to a proverb. Why should I be afraid in evil days? When the wickedness of those at my heels surrounds me. The wickedness of those who put their trust in their goods. And those of their great riches. We can never ransom ourselves. Or deliver to God the price of our life. For the ransom of our life is so great. And we should never have enough to pay. In order to live forever and ever. For we see that the wise die also, like the dull and stupid they perish. And leave their wealth to those who come after them. Their graves, shall, their graves shall be their homes forever, their dwelling places from generation to generation. Though they call the lands after their own names. Even though honored, they cannot live forever. Such is the way of those who foolishly trust in themselves. And the end of those who delight in their own words. 
The second reading is found in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then, the, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in, your, in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free, but Christ is all and in all. Here ends the readings. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. <clears throat> Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. This is the gospel of our Lord. To you, uh, please be seated. Towards the end of Paul's letter, first letter to Timothy, Timothy, of course, being a pastor and Paul being his uh, mentor of sorts, giving him some guidance as a pastor of a church, so to say. And he says to him in verse 18 of chapter 6 of Timothy, he says, instruct those, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works to be generous and ready to share with others, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. That line right there jumps out at me 
And of course, it's an echo. It is an echo of what is happening in our gospel reading today. So I, I'm titling this message today that very line from Paul's words to Timothy, and that is, that which is life indeed. Today's texts, in fact, all of them, uh, have a subtext, have a message that is consistent, right? And we all heard it. It's, it is a message against trusting in wealth, trusting in riches, um, spending your life seeking the accumulation of wealth, the accumulation of possessions, um, all of these things that in many ways are recognitions that Scripture is replete with uh, um, warnings, I would say, against raising the idea or raising the, the, the idea of seeking after wealth, of the love of money, things like that, uh, as can being a big problem in our lives. And so we have this consistent message through each of these texts. But today I don't want to preach necessarily against wealth, against money, any of these things. But rather I want to ask the question of what is the counterpoint? What is scripture offering? What is Jesus offering? What do we see here in Timothy as being the counterpoint. And the word often used here is life. You know, when Jesus is talking here to this individual who is um, upset, he, it, it, what apparently happened here, and we'll just kind of say a little context, is that um, a brother, two brothers, parents passed away, and there was an estate, and the older brother course gets a larger bit of the estate at that point that was tradition at that point and the younger brother is coming to Jesus and saying I want you Jesus you know you seem to be like a guy who has authority around here yeah everybody's listening to you my brother will probably listen to you as well so can you please tell him to share the estate equally with me um, and so they're basically bringing their court case to Jesus as the judge and Jesus says well I'm not a judge. I'm not an arbitrator over you. And essentially saying, this is not the life I've come to bring. This is not the value I bring to your life. You're thinking way too small. You're thinking way too low. So right away we start to see that Jesus is offering something different than what we seek in our own lives as the good in life. The good being the ability to sit back and relax because I have a grain bin full of grain that at any point in my life I can reach into and sell so I never have to worry about anything I never have to worry about money it's all there I can as the author says or as the story says I can sit back relax eat be merry right Jesus is saying and providing right away a counterpoint that, that is not what life I have brought come to bring that is not the life I have come to bring that is not what I desire for you to have as the fulfillment of life and of course when I say there is an echo in Timothy it's very clear because in this whole text in Timothy Paul is talking about money he says flee from these things you man of God fight the good fight of faith take hold of the eternal life to which you are called I charge you in the presence of many witnesses, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, who testified the good confession that you keep yourself clean. He says, we have brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, these things then with which we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare of many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I mean, he holds no punches back, right? But as much as this is a preaching against money, it's also a reminder that there is something else out there. 
There is something to fill the void of our longing for peace and security and trusting in wealth. It is what Jesus is talking about with these particular young, this, these young men. It is what Paul is talking about as he speaks to Timothy. It is that which is life indeed, as Paul says. So I want us to consider that which is life indeed. And today, just a couple of, uh, a, a, a few things that I, I see jumping out of the text. They may be reminders, but I think they're wise reminders. And, they're, and it's a blessing to be able to have a text that reminds us of these things in our world that never reminds us of these things, right? Reminders of that which is life indeed. The first reminder I see coming out of the text today <clears throat> is life indeed is a gift. All of it. So easily, we lose sight of that fact. In Paul, echoing the text from what Jesus said in the in the in the um, what Jesus said in the in this parable, he says again. I read it earlier. I charge you in the presence of God, who as a foundation, he says, gives life to all. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life. To all things. And in verse 17, towards the end, he says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited, but to fix their hope, and to fix their hope on uncertainty of riches, but fix their hope on God, who richly supplies us and gives us all things to enjoy. You know, I chose the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, this morning as a way to sort of prime us for this counterpoint. The counterpoint that God is faithful. The song is about God's faithfulness through generations, through all things up and down, to remind us that our security is in a God who gives freely. Not only in the small things in life, we might think, well... When we get a rain shower, that's a gift of God. Yes, it is. It was a nice shower this morning. But reminding ourselves that all of life really is a gift. All of life that we have is a gift. And of course, the thing happening in Luke 12 is that Instead of receiving life as a gift, we find, we find a anecdote of people fighting. Fighting over a scarce resource, an inheritance of a family. And the opposite of living as such life being a gift is living life as though it is all scarce. That it is a zero-sum game and nothing is given for free and we have to earn and take and grab. Right? We learn in our text that again, like I say, life is a gift. And God will provide for the needs that we have rather than to feel as though the only way we can be at ease, the only way we can be at peace, is to build large bins and have enough grain stored for the rest of our lives such that we won't need to worry about anything. Of course, we know that's foolish, right? It doesn't quite work that way. Life indeed is a gift, number one. Number two, life indeed is found in community. In relationship. So often wealth, I think, probably divides us. Wealth so often causes us to be self-sufficient. Individually sufficient, such that we have no need for other people. In fact, that is 
a subtle goal of our society and our economic system is to not have any needs, at least financially, that others would need to meet. But as we get into that particular wealth conundrum and we find ourselves not having the needs, not having needing anything from anybody else, we then lose also something deeper, and that is our need for relationship and community that goes beyond money. Uh, we are created to be social beings. We're created to be in community, to be in the midst of one another, to care for one another. It's a gift. The whole premise of the story with the two brothers is the splitting of that community, right? This is a family that is at odds with each other. This is a close social unit, any family. And we all know stories of families who are at odds with each other over money, right? It happens all too often, especially when it has to do with a generation receiving an inheritance and they can't agree. And we, what we see is the opposite of community building. We see the division of community. We just see the division of families. We see families never speaking to each other. And it's, it's a shame. And it's sad. See, the counterpoint that Jesus is making here, when then he says, your life is being demanded of you, the counterpoint that Paul is making to Timothy when he says, seek after that which is life indeed, includes seeking after a life found in community. I was, I was, uh, if you look at the front of your bulletin, the, the verse today on the front is, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And I'll tell you, I have uh, the bulletin from three years ago. So we have a three-year lectionary cycle, right? So we had the same verse, we had the same text preached on three years ago, and I, I don't think I'm preaching the same sermon. I, I hope not. I, I didn't look back. But I know that I kept that bulletin, and I put that bulletin from that Sunday on my desk in my office. Um, of course, as a farmer, it strikes pretty hard when you read the story about the farmer who decides that he's going to sort of bypass all the insecurities of life by just building bigger grain bins. <laughs> Reminding me as I farm and as I figure numbers and run a business that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. But in that picture, it is an individual with a big bag like Santa Claus almost, you could imagine. Carrying like the bag is burdening him as he's walking. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, that, that's an interesting interpretation of the text, and it's a good one. Uh, then I look at this picture, and I think, well, that's so entirely different. What is this picture trying to convey? Why would they choose this picture as a uh, uh, illustration, so to say, of our text? And I was talking with Sarah about it, and I, and I, think, I think it has to do with what my second point is. Reminding us that life, indeed as Paul says it, is found in community. Um, you have the simplicity of two empty chairs. Um, life, some of the best times in life probably are sitting next to a, someone you care about and love, having a good conversation, right? While your house, big house, perhaps in the background or your land is blurred out, the thing in focus are the two chairs so that two people can sit together, so that community can be created. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, but in the richness of the communities and friendships we build. Number three, life indeed is found only in our relationship toward God. You see, be, behind all of this, of course, behind this question of these individual brothers or these two brothers who are coming to Jesus, they're coming to Jesus and they're asking Jesus to be a judge. They're saying, we, Jesus, you, in, in other words, as we read the text, what we ought to see here and hear in the back of our mind is 
from the book of John where Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is what Jesus offers us in our relationship to him. But so often we come to him for that which is less than life. We come to him to simply be a judge in matters unrelated to our relationship to God. And so the, 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 the two brothers illustrate here the ways in which we misappropriate the life that God has come to bring, the life that we find in relationship to him. And we make him a judge. Or we make him, uh, I don't know, you, you name it. We make him a, a political ally. You know? We make him uh, a partner in our abuse of Scripture. Well, God says, and you decide, you know, like you're going to hold others to a standard that you yourself could not be held to. We use God for all of these things rather than recognizing that God is the source of our life that fills us entirely. God is the thing which fills, as I I know I mentioned this spring, it's a, it's a guiding verse, or a guiding, not a verse, a quote in my life, but uh, there is a vacuum-shaped void, or a, a, a heart-shaped void in our heart. God-shaped void in our heart that only God can fill. And so we seek God in ways that he, he has not presented himself to fill that void, but yet he just asking us to come. Come on bended knee, to come in humility, to come to him, to be in relationship, because he is the one who fills all things. If you look in Colossians, um, it's, it's interesting. If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that which, which are above uh, there, there, there's this whole text that goes on and on about all the meaning of being in Christ, but then it says, in that renewal there is no longer Greek or Jew, circumcised, circumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. And one text says that the translation is Christ fills all things. Right? The only thing that can fill the void in our life, the only thing that is true life indeed, is not money, is not the storing up of riches, is not getting the equal inheritance that you want, is not the security that comes from riches, but is rather the relationship that we have with the Creator, who is a benevolent Creator, as our prayer says today, who is a benevolent God, who cares for us, who provides all things and desires the best for us. And as we cultivate that relationship and as we cultivate that reality with God, what we are doing is building up a treasure in heaven. Of course, that phrase is weird. You think of it as being a place we're building up a treasure, but it's really building up a wealth of relationship with God. And when our life is demanded of us, as it is for, the, for the, the farmer who built the buildings and all of a sudden it says, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. When your soul is required of you, the only thing that will matter is the wealth that you've built up in a relationship to the God who is the creator, who is the redeemer, who is the eternal God, always and forever there, alive, inviting us into relationship with him. That is all of which is life indeed. Amen. We will now, if you would, please turn in your hymnal to 
page 406, uh, we'll sing, Take My Life and Let It Be, as sort of a, a prayer of commitment, a prayer in response to the message today. Page 406. started a wrong verse at one point. I always know when I do that because Sarah starts to sing extra loud. <laughs> Trying to make a point. <laughs> I don't know, I just get distracted and I start on the wrong verse. And I guess I'm thinking about other things. Anyway, if you would please stand now for the Apostles' Creed. On page 65. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. At this time, you may be seated, and we'll have the offering, and then um, move on to the prayers.
Please remain standing at this time for the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we come before you today. I'm thankful that you are a God having no reason to create anything, created the gift of this world that we live in, created each and every one of us. Lord, we give you praise and we worship you today for the gift that life is. Help us to have the, the, that idea, have that memory, have that thought running through our hearts and our minds at all times. Lord, we come before you today in lifting up to prayer your whole church, asking that your church hearing this text in many churches, in many parts of the world this day, would have the response, not of feeling shame about money, but rather recognizing the greater good, recognizing the life, the true life that you bring. The life that we find in you, Lord Jesus, the life that the gift of life you give us in relationship and in community with others. The freedom in life that we feel when we see it as a gift. Help the church to be a counterpoint in a world that fears scarcity and fears losing and fears so much. Lord, in your mercy, Father, today we pray for the nations. We pray, Father, for The nation of Ukraine continue to be embattled with Russia. We ask for peace. We ask for that war to come to an end. Lord, bring it to hasten the war to its conclusion. Be with those who've lost so so much and so many. We pray for the nations that are uh, have gone with gone with less because of lack of grain exports, many nations in Africa. We pray for all those who've been disrupted by this war throughout the world. God, we pray for our own nation. Uh, We thank you that we live in a nation uh, where we are very blessed. Lord, they are gifts. All of it is gifts. Lord, help us as a people to recognize the gift of this nation we live in, to come together, to preserve it in unity, in a vision for the common good. Help our leaders to lead in unity for the common good. Lord, in your mercy. For those in need today, Lord God, I pray for uh, the many that are battling cancer. I pray for Joel Fuhrer, Jerry Lugodensky, Leanne. For for those, I, I pray for continued strength and healing, for hope, perseverance. We pray for the family of Scott Clute. as they mourn his passing. We pray for healing for Jim Stiles as he continues to battle various health issues. We pray for wisdom for the doctors as they treat him, asking that he would be back on his feet, enjoying life as he does. Lord, we pray for the needs of those that are not listed that I have not mentioned lifting up to you all the needs represented here of ourselves, of our friends, and of our family. Lord, in your mercy. For this church, Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for, uh, in my absence, the, uh, the continued help and stepping in, filling in the gap, the commitment to this church by so many. Uh, it's good to be back and good to see everybody, and I thank you, God, that um, 
that you are present here when we meet together. Go with us now in the week to come. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. All right. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision, 776. everybody. So good to see you again. Uh, hopefully see you back next week. Take care. I'll, like I said, I'll just refrain from shaking hands and stuff, but have a great week.